So now that you've had a taste of what portfolio theory is and how it's done, let's go back and think a little bit about the big picture. What does it all mean? One big picture uh, point I'd like to make, let's go back to the very simplest portfolio theory kind of question and, and see how it fits in with everything else we've been doing all quarter. So here's a simple portfolio theory uh, sort of question. Maximize expected utility of consumption. Consumption equals wealth, no job, which is invested rate of return times initial wealth. Let's do that problem. So we're going to choose the uh, portfolio weights W, portfolio weight W, to maximize the utility of terminal wealth. That one you can do in your sleep by now. Uh, it's, the, it's U prime of what's inside here, or der derivative with respect to W, times the uh, rate of return on the asset tomorrow. The WT cancels into the zero. Of course, WT plus one is the same thing as CT plus one. So the first order condition for, you, for portfolio maximization is this guy here. And the first order conditions for portfolio maximization that we've been studied all along are fundamentally exactly that guy there. Wait a minute. We saw that on the first day. <laughs> we were ending up exactly where we started with, with uh, the one expected margin utility times return uh, as the centerpiece of everything in finance. We're doing something a little bit different with it now. What we were doing before is we were fixing consumption and using that to derive expected returns. From this, we derived expected returns depend on consumption betas and so on and so forth. What we're doing now is exactly the opposite. We're fixing the properties of expected returns and we're deriving consumption. By deriving the portfolio weights, we are deriving what terminal wealth will be and therefore we are deriving the stochastic character of consumption. So, so which is right? How, you know, why are you allowed to do one or the other? Well, of course, both are right. It's just how are you using this question? This, this equation depends on the question you're asking. The question we're asking now is, given some properties of, of returns, what is the optimal portfolio weight and what is the optimal consumption? It turns out the question we were asking before was a more subtle question. It is, what must the expected return and variance have been so that the answer to the optimal portfolio question is to just hold the market portfolio or to, eat, uh, or to eat the aggregate consumption stream. That's fundamentally what we were doing. It's a little uh, uh, harder logic, and it's kind of interesting to see how that, uh, how that really pans out. But yes, it's right to do either one. In one case, you're asking the individual demand question. The other case, you're saying, how must market prices have adjusted so that people's demand is equal to what supply is? And that was the appropriate way to use this equation in order to study um, the pricing questions. This is the appropriate way to use the equation to study demand questions. Traditionally, one did portfolio theory as demand and then supply equals demand to get to the market. We didn't have to do that, which seemed like a simple way to organize things. So it does make sense in the context of larger things we're doing. Now, with that stated, there's sort of a conundrum. Before we derived the cap M, the I cap M, and so forth, uh, so that the investor held the market. Now we're thinking about investors not holding the market portfolio and doing something different. But the average investor still has to end up holding the market portfolio. The average alpha relative to the market portfolio is zero. Alpha is always a zero sum game. I can only benefit by doing something different from the market portfolio if you do worse than the market portfolio. We can't even all rebalance. So standard portfolio advice is, say you might hold 60, 20 stocks and bonds. Stocks go up, so you hold now 80, 60, 40, sorry. You start with 60, 40. Stocks go up, so now you hold 80, 20. Every bit of portfolio advice says rebalance back. But if you're selling, who's buying? The average investor can't rebalance. The average investor has to sit on what's out there and not, not even rebalance. So why should you do anything different from the average person? Uh, in what way are you different? Portfolio advice cannot apply to every, everybody. And yet what we've written down here looks like it applies to everybody. If everybody tries to do it, then they just change prices and we come back to holding the market portfolio again. So portfolio advice has to be based, if you're not just going to sit and hold the market, how are you different from other people? Now, most people who are actively trading say, well, I'm smarter than everybody else. And half of them are deluded. Just by arithmetic, half of them have to be diluted because we can't all be smarter than average. And certainly knowledge of the formula sigma inverse mu I don't think qualifies as making you smarter than the average person on Wall Street. 
Now, I think the Merton model comes to the rescue here in resolving this conundrum of why is there a Wall Street, why is there a portfolio theory, why not just sit and hold the market portfolio? It gets us away from alpha, it gets us away from this zero-sum game. It points to the fact that there's lots and lots of different kinds of risks and that maybe what we should be doing is thinking where we want to be on that multi-factor efficient frontier, which dimensions of risk do we want to take, which kinds of insurance do we buy, which kinds do we sell, that that's more important than alpha. That's why I've expressed the portfolio theory in terms of differences. Uh, and that seems like a, a productive way to think about portfolio theory. This is a hard problem, uh, at least above uh, uh, playing this zero-sum alpha game. Also, as I showed you, sigma inverse mu, th these calculations are horribly unstable. Well, again, expressing the theory in terms of differences, my risk aversion relative to average, my state variable aversion relative to average, rather than in terms of sigma inverse mu, and understanding the economic functions of those differences, that seems to pave the way forward to doing something more than just this alpha chasing. Now there's a paradox. I, I showed you this beautiful Merton theory and the hedging demands. Merton wrote that paper in, the in about 1970. It's either the 70 or the 72. And yet hedging demands don't get used. Um, the average hedge fund is really good at the market timing demands and, does not, and uses a mean variance optimizer with no hedging demands. Now that's a paradox. It makes no sense. If you're founded on the idea that, that ET of R and sigma T vary over time and you have quantitative models of time varying expected returns and you expect to live more than a month, then Merton says state variables for investment opportunities matter. And how do you know you're not making the mistake of, of short-term bonds versus long-term bonds? Um, so why don't they use them? Well, that's a bit of a paradox. I think one answer is that these, state, these ETAs, their value function derivatives, Nobody really knows how to calculate them in simple examples. Uh, anything vaguely realistic is done numerically. And I think everyone feels, ah, that's kind of nebulous and too hard. Uh, I've seen lots of hedge funds. Lots of them have time-varying mean returns in their, uh, in their models. And, and none of them has hedging demands in their portfolio formations. All mean variance are frontiers. Now, a, a hint, maybe we, we need to rewrite portfolio theory. The bond example, I think, has is, been very important in my own thinking. The bond example, again, says long-term bonds are appropriate for uh, long-term investors. They're the risk-free asset for long-term investors. Why? Well, because they happen to be a security whose state variable correlates with rates of return. That's kind of nebulous. But if you just think about long-term bonds, they're risk-free to long-term horizon. Maybe looking at it long-term rather than looking at the instantaneous portfolio is the way to wisdom and the way to doing a better job of portfolio theory. So in that vein, let's, let's tie one last thing together. What about discount factors? This course has been all about discount factors, and, and I haven't, we haven't really seen them show up yet in portfolio theory. Well, we actually have. We did this portfolio theory once before, and let me remind you how it looked. If you were all primed with discount factors, you would have done nothing of what we did today. You would have, you would have thought this way. Look, let's take means and covariances, and let's, take the, let's summarize the means and covariances by a discount factor. You now know how to construct a, a discount factor from means and covariances of returns. Then my portfolio theory I'll express as maximize utility of consumption, such that the discounted value of consumption is initial wealth. And we've solved this one. The margin utility of consumption is lambda times the discount factor, state by state. Or, uh, so that tells us what consumption should be. In the power example, consumption should be lambda times the discount factor to the minus 1 over gamma. So this is e eminently doable from a set means and variances of securities. Calculate the discount factor, and that tells you what the investor should do. Now, think about what we've done here. Uh, I've shown you the answer without showing you the dynamic trading strategy. What stocks and bonds do you buy? Well, that, that we, that's in there, but it's harder to find. Maybe you don't buy stocks and bonds. Maybe you, you use dynamic spanning theorems to put together a portfolio of options that delivers the optimal consumption. In doing things this way, we've separated the final payoff from the financial engineering of how you deliver that final payoff. Whereas the Merton method 
is intimately does both of them together. We find actual consumption, but to find actual consumption, we have to spend all this time on the dynamic hedging strategy that gets us there. The dynamic hedging strategy involves nebulous value function derivatives, and everybody just throws it out and goes on as, as life as usual, it, where there's time varying mean returns in the model and no time varying mean returns in the portfolio theory. Maybe that's the road looking directly at the long horizon payoffs that will let us finally, after 55 years, start making portfolio theory, uh, dynamic portfolio theory practical. So where are we? Portfolio theory is now a guide, a parable, a useful set of stories, uh, certainly helpful to avoid big mistakes like, like buying individual securities and not thinking about portfolios. It's yet uh, not really ready for prime time, despite all the effort on it, to give quantitative answers. And that just means there's lots more to do in finance, which is, of course, why we're all here. <laughs>